And I want to introduce my friend, Carl Boggs. He's written 25 books, 10 on the topic of U.S. imperialism and militarism. That includes most, most recently origin, Origins of the Warfare State and the Hollywood War Machine. He has been involved with anti-war uh, movement activities since the 1960s and was purged from his job as professor at Washington U University in St. Louis because of his anti-war work. Carl has been a regular contributor to Counterpunch since 1995. I've been reading his latest book, um, Facing Catastrophe. It's really a very heavy book. And I want to introduce Carl Box. Thank you so much, Frank. Thanks, thanks so much. I'm so honored to be a part of this uh, wonderful event. Um, uh, and I want to thank Frank and Rachel and uh, Code Pink and everybody else involved. Um, I think it would be a very good idea, in fact, uh, to have something like this on a regular basis. Um, I was just thinking, uh, just sitting here, I was just thinking about the fact that it's been um, 55 years or 50, 55, something like that, years since I first got involved in anti-war activity, uh, fighting uh, US militarism and imperialism, fighting the uh, war in, in Vietnam. I was uh, one of the student uh, organizers for the uh, Vietnam Day Committee in uh, the spring of 1965 at UC Berkeley. And I believe it was one of, if not the first, one of the first major protests against the war in Vietnam. And uh, I was uh, very much involved in organizing that. It was right after the free speech movement in Berkeley. And then um, after that, I wound up uh, going to um, Washington University in St. Louis, where there was a very, very intense anti-war movement. Uh, our, our turnouts were thousands and thousands of people every single day uh, for weeks and months and a couple of years. We burned down two ROTC buildings. Uh, the FBI infiltrated uh, extensively. And after uh, a couple of years working at Washington University, I realized that one of my research assistants was uh, an FBI informant. And then one thing led to another and I was eventually just purged from the place. I was blacklisted. Uh, basically my job was finished, my career was finished and I was blacklisted uh, by the uh, mid to late seventies. And uh, the uh, uh, corporate interests that ran the university included McDonnell Douglas, Monsanto and a couple of others. So you can imagine uh, <laughs> The, uh, the, uh, the obstacles to uh, doing anti-war movement there were considerable. We did set up a, a very historic a project called McDonnell Douglas Anti-Corporate Project. And it was an attempt, one of the few I think in the country to merge a working class struggles with anti-war struggles. And that lasted for a few years. And then again, the university eventually put a, a crush uh, the kibosh on that. Um, I wanted to just mention uh, a number of people have mentioned uh, the the uh, the issue of racism in U.S. foreign policy, and I thought about the fact that um, in uh, the last over a century, the United States um, has done pretty much everything in its power uh, to destroy uh, six Asian countries hasn't completely succeeded, but not for, not for trying. The Philippines, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. Um, and uh, you know the, the, the element of racism in this was very, very intense. Uh, John Dower, uh, a historian, wrote a book, uh, War Without Mercy, talked about how the war in the Pacific was uh, considerably more racist and the war in Europe. And in fact, at one point, this is before Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, uh, under uh, the direction of Curtis LeMay, uh, the United States Air Force obliterated 66 German, uh, Japanese cities using incendiary uh, weapons, napalm, and all sorts of other devices that were basically anti-personnel uh, weapons. And uh, that was the lead up to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So, um, Basically, every major city in Japan was uh, annihilated. And that same um, modus operandi was carried forward into Korea, 
where at one point in time, in fact, um, President Truman was actually considering the use of uh, thermonuclear weapons there. Um, what's interesting there, and I was gonna talk a little bit about um, the nuclear complex, and of course, uh, that being part of the way in which the, the, the American power structure is able to establish um, uh, uh, its hegemony and maintain its hegemony and use its uh, leverage worldwide because um, the, uh, the whole issue of um, uh, you know, the war economy, the permanent war economy and uh, the uh, empire of bases and so forth uh, is solidified and magnified by the fact that there, there's um, the, the presence of such weapons of mass destruction. But what I've argued, and I've written about this uh, before, is that there are actually five different types of weapons of mass destruction. And the United States, of course, is the only country to have used them all. Uh, obviously, nuclear weapons in Japan, uh, chemical, weapon, uh, ch chemical weapons very extensively in the case of, uh, of Vietnam and uh, Indochina. And then in addition to that, uh, what's not very widely known is that um, biological warfare was introduced in Korea. And uh, it was not very successful, but it was used by the United States um, in Korea. And then two other weapons of mass destruction, one of which I just mentioned, was what I would call aerial terrorism. That is to say saturation bombing of uh, large cities with the, with the intent of basically leveling them and destro destroying uh, you know, the civilian population there. That would have to be considered uh, a weapon of mass destruction. And then the fifth, which the United States has used very liberally and very extensively over the last basically nearly a century, is uh, economic sanctions. The worst, of course, being what the Clinton administration did uh, against Iraq, uh, killing uh, upwards of a half a million people, mostly children, uh, in the 1990s. So the United States um, not only has conducted very extensively you know, forms of uh, racist warfare in the Pacific and elsewhere, but has conducted uh, these different uh, forms of uh, weapons of mass destruction uh, throughout. And um, again, uh, I think it's worth, because a lot of times people just think, when they think of WMD, they think in terms of, uh, they think in terms of uh, nuclear weapons and that may be about it. But there are actually five different types and the United States has relied upon those, uh, many of them fairly extensively, um, especially uh, aerial terrorism and uh, economic sanctions. Um, I just wanted to basically talk a little bit about the degree to which the nuclear complex fits so centrally into the American power structure. Today, the American power structure is not only the most um, powerful, uh, the most globalized, but it's also the most threatening power structure, I believe, in the history of the world and the, um, the development of uh, Nuclear, the nuclear complex and nuclear power fits very centrally with, within that. Um, one of the things the United States has done against the statutes of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation uh, Treaty, the NPT, uh, is to continue the modernization of nuclear weaponry, labs, facilities, deployments, subs, planes, uh, bomb types, tactical nuclear weapons, uh, networks in the field. Uh, there's an extensive uh, U.S. nuclear deployment in Europe, uh, as some, some commentators have mentioned, and uh, that is continuing uh, and is uh, expanding uh, right now. Um, so th that is um, the process of modernization, which is earmarked really to cost about a trillion dollars over the next uh, three decades, is ongoing with the United States. That's an opposite. That's in violation of the Nuclear um, uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty, because um, uh, the treaty basically uh, injuncts uh, it has an injunction that states that uh, you know all nuclear states should move towards uh, disarmament, and of course the United States is moving in just uh, the opposite direction. Um, 
what I wanted to just point out here is that I think at this point in time, we are at a point where I think the threat of global nuclear catastrophe is probably as great, if not greater, than at any point in recent history. And I think that's the case for uh, at least four reasons. One is this process of modernization. The process of modernization here, of course, uh, inspires the process of more modernization in Russia and China and elsewhere. It feeds into the nuclear arms races, which we continue to have. Um, even though the number of nuclear warheads is far less than what it was at the peak of the Cold War, where we had tens and tens of thousands, now there's globally maybe 15, 16,000 warheads. Uh, the fact is that the warheads that exist are much more powerful, much more accurate, uh, and much more efficient than the earlier warheads. So it's misleading to think that there's been some sort of reduction in overall you know, nuclear uh, power uh, uh, available in the world. Um, the threat of, of uh, accidental war is also much greater at this point in time, uh, owing to um, the possibilities of, of uh, computer malfunction, um, faulty intelligence, power failures, human error, um, cyber warfare, all these things have, I think, exacerbated the threat of accidental nuclear war. Uh, we know, and I think, I, I think that it's um, pointed out in uh, Dan Ellsberg's book uh, um, that um, I think we've had six episodes just since the early 1980s of near, um, near uh, nuclear war coming from uh, this kind of uh, accidental situation. Third, um, we see uh, a mounting conflict between the United States and Russia with the US NATO push uh, to, uh, you know, eastward with deployments um, near Russian borders uh, and military exercises there, economic sanctions, ongoing threats. Um, this has been a process at particularly intense since uh, the 90s with the dismemberment of Yugoslavia, the attack on Serbia, then subsequent attacks on, um, uh, you know, on, on involvements in Georgia and Ukraine, bringing the United States much closer to um, an intense geopolitical conflict with Russia. That is continuing. And of course, what's exacerbated that is Russiagate. Um, which um, has produced uh, a new Cold War between the United States and Russia. And now we have a situation where the two nuclear powers are facing off against each other under the most tense of conditions. We know also, uh, and Eric Mann mentioned this and some others have mentioned it as well, uh, we know that um, one of the neocon uh, objectives is um, to uh, target Russia, hoping to isolate and weaken uh, the country, um, if not very basically carry out some form of regime change. I believe re regime change is basically on the agenda here as far as the neocons uh, are concerned. I would say a fifth problem uh, contributing to the possible um, intensification of, uh, or the po possible increasing threat of thermonuclear war is uh, the problem of nuclear proliferation. And uh, that is not anything that the United States or any country uh, really presently has done much to correct. So I would uh, argue that um, uh, the political alternative here is that given the present threat that we face, um, the, only, uh, the only solution is some sort of radical move towards full-scale nuclear disarmament consistent with uh, the dictates of the, national, the NPT. That should be a prevailing goal of humanity. Unfortunately, it is the American power structure described above that remains the biggest impediment to such um, historic move. And insane and immoral US foreign policy must be changed and very soon. And I think the fact that we see these recent moves towards the demonization, or we should say the further demonization of Russia and Putin are not exactly contributing to this uh, process. 
And I just make one final comment. I think it's really a sad commentary to think the degree to which many, uh, many progressives and many leftists are sort of bought into this demonization process. It's not really helping uh, the cause of peace. It's only helping the cause of war. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carl. Very important testimony. We're going to have more on Cold War and the environment at the end of the program in the chat and a little bit um, live. Next, we have um, a super special guest. Uh, Medea is moving up in the program a little. Thank you so much on the East Coast for, for staying uh, awake and with us, Medea. Um, she will be speaking on her experience with the seeing the Cold War's effect on the African liberation struggles in Africa. Medea Benjamin is the co-founder of the group Code Pink, Women for Peace, and the co-founder of the human rights group Global Exchange. She has been an advocate for social justice for more than 40 years. Medea writes books. She speaks at many anti-war events. She organizes and takes activists to other countries, and she has spoken out at government events, where she is often removed from the room for interrupting. But she is actually speaking truth to power. Medea? Well, thank you so much, Rachel. And it's really amazing what you and Frank and Mary behind the scenes there have organized. I've met people uh, or seen and heard them that I've long wanted to meet. And it just seems like such a rich uh, bringing together of so many aspects of this Cold War. Uh, like many of the other speakers, my life has really been shaped by the Cold War, including the Vietnam War. Uh, when I was in high school, I was taught that if we didn't stop communism over there, we would be fighting communism here at home. And then when my sister's boyfriend was drafted to go and fight in Vietnam, and he sent her home the ear of a Viet Cong as a souvenir, that's when I joined the anti-war movement, which I have never left. Uh, my government's hatred of communism really uh, inspired me to learn more about it, not just by reading the books of Marx and Lenin, uh, but also first as a hippie and later as a UN nutritionist and an economist, uh, traveling the world in support of liberation and socialist struggles. And everywhere I went, I was devastated to find that my own government was supporting the most reactionary forces that were trying to quash any of these experiments. This was especially true in Africa, where anti-communism and US corporate interests colored virtually every aspect of US policy. Take, for example, the Congo, formerly a colony of Belgium, where the liberation leader, Patrice Lumumba, scared the US corporations. They feared they would lose access to the nation's vast minerals. Uh, they accused him of being close to the Soviets. And in 1961, the US government helped orchestrate a coup in which he was killed and replaced with the dictator, Mobuto Sese Seku, who robbed the nation's resources, ruled over the people brutally for three decades. Anti-communism put the US in bed with the despicable apartheid government in South Africa, the brutal Portuguese colonial rulers in Angola, Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, the white minority government of Ian Smith in Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, which only yielded to majority rule in 1980. I worked in uh, Africa for much of the uh, latter part of the 70s and into the uh, early part of the 80s, and I saw firsthand the devastation of the Cold War. I want to give the example when I went to work in Mozambique. Mozambique had just won its independence in 1975 after a long, grueling armed struggle. But there was elation that they were building something new something exciting, something different. The president was Samora Machel. His wife was Grasso Machel, who later married Nelson Mandela after Machel died in a mysterious plane crash. But Samora Machel was a terrific leader. He used to be a nurse. He left nursing to join the liberation struggle and fight with the movement for Limo. After independence, I remember he would gather thousands of people together every single week in the sports stadium. And first they would start out singing with five part harmony. Uh, and then he would give long talks and have discussions with the people and empower them about building a new society. 
The Portuguese had been among the worst, well, the worst colonizers in the world. They left a totally impoverished nation with a 95% illiteracy rate. Frilimo's motto was each one teach one and everywhere you looked, under the trees, under the rooftops, in the evenings, in the schools, people would teach each other how to read and write, how to add and, sub add and subtract. I was working as a nutritionist and every day we work with farmers in the fields to increase yield so they could better feed the people. Everywhere there was tremendous excitement. We were building a new society, becoming a model for the rest of Africa, a model of cooperation, overcoming tribal differences, liberating women, empowering youth. But this cooperative model of empowered black citizens was a threat to US allies in the white ruled South Africa and Rhodesia. They labeled the Mozambican government communist and began funding an armed opposition movement called Reynamo. Reynamo began to attack villages. They burned entire villages, raped women, took them as sex slaves. They forced children to become soldiers. In fact, a third of their forces were children. They destroyed hospitals, roads, schools, any infrastructure that existed. This war lasted for 15 years. About a million people were killed or starved. 5 million displaced. The US government's own study said, a large number of civilians in these attacks were victims of purposeful shooting deaths and executions, of axing, killing, bayoneting, burning to death, forced drowning and asphyxiation, and other forms of murder where no meaningful resistance or defense is present. This sounds very much like the extremist forces terroring Mozambicans today who call themselves followers of ISIS and publicly behead women and children. One can make the argument that the breakdown of society during Renamo's long, brutal war paved the way for the devastating attacks today. While Africa continues to feel the consequences of the last Cold War, it's also the site of competition today between the United States and China. China is expanding its influence by building infrastructure and making investments all over the continent, including buying up land. The US is building military bases and beefing up AFRICOM. But if you wanna see a real example of solidarity with Africa, look at the poor small island nation of Cuba. While working in Africa, I met Cubans all over the continent. They weren't exploiting the resources or profiting from business ventures or building up military bases? No. Some of them were there as soldiers to stop right-wing forces, but most of them, over 100,000 Cubans, went to Africa working as much needed doctors, nurses, teachers, technicians, and living in some of the poorest villages on the continent. And tens of thousands of African youth were invited to Cuba to study for free, becoming doctors, engineers, and other professionals. Most recently, Cuban doctors and nurses have been traveling around the continent, treating people for COVID and stopping its spread. It's amazing that this impoverished island nation of 11 million people battered by the United States for 60 years as part of the Cold War exemplifies such a beautiful example of solidarity. As Mozambique's first president, Samora Michelle said back in 1975, International solidarity is not an act of charity. It's an act of unity between allies fighting on different terrains towards the same objectives. The foremost of these objectives, he said, is to aid the development of humanity to the highest level possible. Let us practice solidarity by working hard to shut down AFRICOM and US bases now littered across the continent. Let us work together with our African neighbors to fight COVID and other diseases and hunger at home and abroad and address the climate crisis that's creating million of African, millions of African refugees. As Samora Michelle ended every talk with the people, a luta continua, victoria es certa. The struggle continues, victory is certain. Thank you. Thank you so much, Medea. Brava, you know, and leave it to Medea to come up with an, another amazing project. Um, Africa, let's steer this uh, Cold War Truth Commission definitely 
um, and, and work on, on everything that you just mentioned. So incredible. Why don't we, you introduce Father Roy? Okay. Thanks, Rachel. Um, Roy, Roy Bouchoir, uh, Father Roy, as we like to call him, he, he um, uh, served in the Navy as an officer in Vietnam. And after that, he was moved by what he saw there. So we joined the Marino missionaries, same with Blaise was and Teresa Bonpain were, and uh, ordained to the priesthood in 1972. And he served the poor in South and Central America. His experiences with death squads uh, there impelled him to oppose U.S. training of armies in counterinsurgency at Fort Benning, Georgia. Hundreds of thousands have demonstrated to close the infamous School of the Americas. Uh, Roy founded the School of America's Watch in 1990. Uh, in 2008, he decided he must also address an injustice closer to home, that of, of the exclusion of women from the Catholic Roman Catholic priesthood. His refusal to recant and deny the dictates of his conscience eventually led to his being excommunicated as a priest by the Catholic Church. He was a marino priest for 45 years, and they, he didn't kick him out because he was fighting against U.S. foreign policy. They didn't kick him out because he was one of the closest school Americas. They kicked him out because he wanted women to become priests. Anyway, we love Roy, and there's a clip we're going to show now. It's from the, the clip. This is a short clip, and it's from the film Paying the Price for Peace, the story of S. Brian Wilson, and it's about the school Americas, and it features Roy, and Brian uh, is also in it, and Martin Sheen are also in this clip you're going to see. The train attack drew attention to the U.S. That's military's it. involvement in illegal wars, highlighting its role in training secret armies for other countries. Most of the covert training took place in Fort Benning, Georgia, at the notorious School of the Americas. As we gather today at the main gate of Fort Benning, Mientras nos reunimos en estos portones del Fuerte Benning, this is a very sacred moment. Este es un momento muy sagrado. We cannot go about the business of killing without being changed. We cannot come back from Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, and other wars and go on with our lives as before. No. You know, all these suicides, the PTSD that we're reading so much about now, the message is clear. We are not made for war. This is where SOA Watch started, right here. And I realized something that was uh, staggering to me, but it was uh, something that all of you probably uh, completely understand without having to go to war, and that was that we're all one. We're all connected, and how could I be possibly uh, participating in killing other people I did not know just because I was ordered to do it? So I learned how to be disobedient. When 525 Salvadoran soldiers arrived at Fort Benning, Georgia to start training there in combat, a small group of us went there to say not in our name. And what we found through the Freedom of Information Act was a school of assassins, as we learned it was well known of it in Latin America, a school for dictators, a school of torture. The Washington Post front page, along with the New York Times, had a very big article about the, the, the torture manuals that were used at the School of the Americas techniques of torture. This is serious. This is serious stuff. We talk about crimes against humanity here. And it was time to put out the word. Let's gather here every November, that weekend before Thanksgiving. And in the name of solidarity, let us come and call for the closing of this school of assassins. And something happened. We started with 10, and then the next year, you know, 100 came. And then the next year, 500, and then 1,000, then 3,000, 5,000, 10,000. All of a sudden, we had 20,000 people gathering here. And when they sent us to prison, 
it just energized the movement. Uh, it just brought more people the next year. And when they sent us to prison, what we learned was that they could not silence us. The truth cannot be silenced. And we organized from prison. We went to Latin America simply to request that they stop sending their troops here. And I'm happy to report that five countries made decisions to pull out. Those countries being Argentina, Uruguay, Venezuela, uh, Bolivia. We went to Ecuador, where we met with President Rafael Correa. And at that meeting, he announced that Ecuador was pulling out of the School of the Americas. He, he said something very important, President Correa. He said, this school should not exist. We cannot live without cooperation. It's the most important characteristic of human survival. When we become so arrogant, we justify doing anything we want as if there's no consequences. It's insanity. We've come to a level of divorcing ourselves from the reality of war. The West has taught the East how to solve problems, and it's basically through violence. You can't make war sacred. So you should all look at um, Cold War in the Heartland. It's a new, very important website out of the University of Kansas, Heartland, talking about farmers. And um, his talk was going to be a patriotic descent in the Cold War. He has it on film. Um, he's going to be submitting testimony a little later, but he, he had to leave for his, his kids. Um, but I just want to say again, that Heartland perspective, we really need to reach uh, rural America. And just if you think about it, a lot of the Trump um, commercials really highlighted the cost of war to American veterans, to people who died, to families, a lot more than the Democrats ever did. I really found like a lot of sympathy they were using um, that. So interesting. Um, and we can too with the truth. And this is the international portion of our program. Um, and just so you know, it is so late. We started at 1, a, 1 p.m. Western time because four months ago when we were starting to plan this, we thought we'd be watching Frank's movie for the last two hours, sitting, chilling, and all you on the East Coast would be fine. Uh, turned out a little different, um, but we're delighted. So, um, Nuri, Frank, you are going to introduce um, Nuri, please. Okay, th thanks, Rachel. Uh, my friend Nuri Ranaki was born in Iran. After the CIA coup in Iran in 1953, her family, excuse me, was forced to migrate to the United States. She got her master's in economics from the University of Wisconsin. She's been a member of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom for 50 years. She was a member of the National Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression. She established the Free Palestine Organization in Hawaii and was the founder of education, not incarceration in Oakland. And she is the co current co-founder of the US Department of Peace. Nuri is a fantastic woman. She's bought thousand copies of A Dick of the War for me. She gives them away for free to everybody. And she's such a wonderful woman. Nuri, are you there? Yes, thank you, thank you for- And Al. I, yeah, I really wanted to save you all that time. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you, Frank. Uh, and uh, for go, but there are some interesting things that I would like to yeah mention. I was born in Iran, and when I was 10 years old or younger, Mossadegh came to power. And so during Mossadegh, British, of course, because of our oil, it always is because of resources that United States wants to go and rob those countries, the same as... Uh, uh, everywhere else. So British um, went to war against Iran and uh, US didn't come to help Iran. So we are used to sanctions from 70 years ago when I was a child. And uh, then um, uh, CIA, then Do Dr. Mossadegh nationalized oil, which was Iranian resource and others. So uh, US during Eisenhower, Eisenhower, I was 13 years old, they carried coup d'etat in 1953 against Dr. Mossadegh 
and overthrow him. Um, while Mossadegh asked Eisenhower if he could uh, go between United between Iran and British and be mediator and make peace. And Eisenhower not only didn't do that, but uh, they also sanctioned Iran, didn't help financially, and they carried coup d'etat in 1953. Well, I was very young. My whole family had to migrate to United States. My brother was almost executed. He was physician, just graduating, and he was about to uh, be killed that a friend of us saved, saved him. Then we had to come to US. Then I, when I, and I became active in United States with American Soviet Friendship Society and um, other, uh, so from childhood I was active. Then um, my father died in 19, um, then when my father died during Shah, who was, Shah became, Shah uh, was put back in power by United States. And the first thing did, our resources was used to attack the FAR, which is uh, Western Yemen. So Yemen that we know the war is going on now, 70 years ago or 60, uh, eight years ago, uh, Shah of Iran with Iranian resources on behalf of United States became gendarme of the region and start killing Middle Eastern, any resistance. And uh, so many 30,000 Tofari people were killed with Iranian money for United States uh, benefit. And then they created Savak and Evin. Savak was famous uh, torture center in Iran. And Evin was the prison that um, were uh, imprisoning all progressives. And I never forget as a child that there was a um, music um, uh, that was created by someone that they were going to execute him. And he was uh, asking his child, his daughter, kiss me goodbye for the last time. This became a music for Iranian for so many, many years of so many that they were executed by Shah. Um, and Kiss Me Goodbye was the famous song of so many that they were. So then I, we had to come to U.S. In U.S. when my father died in 1978, as American citizen, I had to go back. And when I went back, they arrested me and put me in solitary confinement in Evan prison. And I thought, wow, am I really that useful and that good that United States or Iranian government um, is afraid of me and putting me in solitary confinement? I was there for two and a half months, but then the revolution was taking place in Iran and they had to get rid of me. I didn't worth all that. So, and I would see in prison, I would hear that they would pull the young men, that they would torture them and they couldn't walk. You would hear um, and you could see if I had a little hole in my prison once in a while, they wouldn't drop the thing that they were in control to drop it that I couldn't that I couldn't see outside. Once in a while they would forget and I would look and I would see that they are pulling these political prisoners that they tortured already to take them to their cell after the torture. Or, you know, that kind of things that you could witness, that I would witness so, so regularly when I was in solitary confinement. So then I came to US and then um then the then um the revolution happened and when the revolution happened us we had so many leaders from national front from dr masadek during dr masadek that they um 
were candidate by people to become a new leader, but United States felt at that point that Khomeini, who was enough anti-communist while the revolution was taking place. I, I shouldn't forget to tell you that there was a theater in Abadan that 600 young people that they went for watching movie, United States, they blocked everything and they burned the whole theater and so many other things. And then at the time of hostage crisis or so-called hostage crisis, I have the book I want to show. Um, you will see that, what did I do with the book? I want to show um, uh, during hostage crisis, um, hostages, nothing happened to them, but, and they were, but the bo six books, it was really spy center in Iran, the American embassy, and they shredded the books and Iranian students, they put these shredded together and it's right here. Yeah, they, they put the books, they shredded a uh, thing that uh, American embassy, top secret, documents. top secret documents, they put it together and they created six books. This is number four that they translated to Persian. And this is this alone is what U.S. was doing for so many years in Afghanistan. So, um, yeah, and then also um, when I came to U.S., when hostage crisis, so-called hostage crisis happened, I was saying that send Shah back so that hostages would be released. So they came from CIA, threatened me that they will, they came to my home and said that they have orders to kill me if I continue to talk. I was medical college of Virginia in Richmond, Virginia. I was studying for my medical record administration that um, then they had to supposedly college had to protect me. Uh, so now, now, and then, um, now what should we really do? I was thinking that we have been to hundreds of countries killing so many, many people. My whole family had to come to US and there are millions of Iranians, not only oil resources, the intelligent and education of all those countries, seven in my family, MDs and PhDs and masters, they all live here and their children was drawn, drawn from uh, those countries and Iran and everywhere else. So I'm hoping that um, uh, what to do would be maybe destination Nicaragua was something that, uh, that Barbara Trent uh, movie made. Uh, Americans were going to Nicaragua and let us make friendship delegations from all those countries, Soviet Union, China, Iran, and bring them here and we go visit them. They would love the people to people delegations and uh, exchanges and educate. We ed get uh, our education of what are, what is our government doing around the world? And the nuclear disarmament that 122 countries they passed and now uh, it is ratified. Uh, it's a world thing that we we could focus on and really stop that danger that everybody talked. I wanted to thank you again, uh, Rachel as well, and Frank. It's such a beautiful thing and I'm going to use these days and weeks for many, many, many people to come and and by the way, it is New Year, Persian New Year. It's the first, second day of spring. Yesterday was Persian New Year. So happy no ruse to all of you. The first day of spring is Persian New Year. And we have half seen, which is seven S's symbolic of 
uh, love, symbolic of uh, health, symbolic of all of these I put together that maybe I can, I don't know if I can show it to you. Um, here we have, these are, these are the, uh, our seven S's symbolic of, uh, we have fish, apple, uh, greenery, and all of these things, symbol of love and peace and harmony and richness and wealth, prosperity. prosperity. Uh, let us, <laughs> let us focus on friendship and love and getting together. Thank you so much. I talk too much. <laughs> No, that, that was so beautiful. Thank you so much, Nuri. As part of Peace Weeks in the L.A. Harbor area, um, Christian Guzman, part of our organizing team, we put on for every Peace Week, we choose a country and we have a whole cultural night and everyone comes to the Zoom or comes to the live meeting when before the pandemic and we share food and we hear stories. And, and the first one we did was on Iran uh, two or three years ago. So we're doing that annually. We're going to do it much more. It's a beautiful, beautiful way definitely yeah, yeah softens you. softens hearts <laughs> thank right. you eating yeah. together and enjoying mm -hmm. of yeah. course Dancing. of course that's that's what we all want okay thank you so much nuri um frank uh, our next testimony <clears throat> okay thank you nuri and alan thank you so much nuri i love you you know um the woman she's always loving and smiling and happy okay uh, next uh uh speaker test giving his testimony is Peter Phillips. He's a political uh, sociology professor from S Sonoma State University. He is the author of uh, 14 project censored yearbooks from 1997 to 2011. Um, he is, his most recent book is Giants, the Global Power Elite from St Seven Stories Press. And I'm pretty sure uh, Peter was a director of the projects. Are you there, Peter? Uh, uh, yeah, projects. hi. Okay. Peter, you were the director of Project Censor for many years, I believe. 14 years, yeah. 14 years, okay. And Peter, I love you, man. Take it away. Well, thank you, Frank and Rachel, for an inspiring program. Uh, I've really been enjoying the last few hours I've been here. And I know you've been here all day, so I will be, do this as quickly as I can. Um, the main point of my book, The Giants, the Global Power Elite, was that if we look at what the Cold War and the US military empire is about, it's primarily the protection of concentrated global capital and the ability for people with money to move it anywhere in the world to invest without any interference from other governments or local populations. That's what a military empire is about, what it's for. That's the primary, that's the primary reason. So driving this, engine of global wealth concentration are giant transnational investment companies like BlackRock, who controls $7 trillion worth of capital. Uh, they, in 1917, I mean, in 2017, there were $17 trillion investment companies that were collectively worth $41.1 trillion in capital. There's about 20 now and it's closer to 50 trillion. These firms all directly invest in each other. So there's this huge cluster of centralized capital managed by only 199 people. So part of my goal in my book was say, well, who are these people that are controlling this $50 trillion worth of wealth? And, and how, what are they doing with it? And, and who helps them? So when you think about Jeff Bezos, you know, worth a hundred billion or more, um, he's incredibly wealthy, but what we're really talking about is the, the idea that the mantra that, that Occupy gave us, the 1% versus the 99%. But even 1%, several hundred million people in the top 1% is still a huge, huge amount of people um, out of 8 billion in the world that they, they own almost everything. And so what we're really talking about is who are the managers of this money how, how do they get the US military empire to support them? 
what are the policy makers and the direction? So these, these elites, and there's about six or 7,000 of them um, who go to Davos, that, that go to the big World Bank forums and all of that, um, they're, the, they're, the, they're the core of the transnational capitalist class and global capitalism. These elites interact through governmental policymaking organizations, privately funded by large corporations, which include the Council of 30, the Trilateral Commission, and the Atlantic Council. Now, the Atlantic Council just came out with a policy statement on China. They want to see regime change there in the next 20 years. They had come out with a policy statement on, on Putin. They wanted to see regime change in Russia. So you have a <clears throat> policy group funded by corporate money that's making recommendations to governments, um, the, the NATO, the intelligence services, security services, the Pentagon, transnational government groups as to how they're going to manage global capital and what needs to be done. And that includes uh, regime changes around the world. So they also inform, they're also talking to G7, G20, the World Bank, International Monetary Fund, International Bank of Settlements. This is very core, it's global, massive amounts of, of, of money involved, trillions of dollars worth, worth of wealth. And the power elites are in support of capital investment. They're collectively embedded in a system of, of mandatory growth. Failure for capital to achieve continued expansion leads to economic stagnation, which could result in depression, bank failures, currency collapses, and mass unemployment. So power elites are kind of trapped in a web of enforced growth that requires ongoing global management and the formation of new and ever expanding capital investment opportunities. They really would like to get into Siberia and, and invest there wildly. Um, you know, they want total control and penetration around the world. That's what this capital is essentially about. So the biggest problem the, the global power elite face is that they have more capital than there are safe investments and opportunities. So they, this can lead to ri risky speculative investments like the subprime mortgage uh, tobacco that we had in 2008 and almost total collapse of, of the world economic system. But also it leads to permanent war spending. A major part of the profits and the continued growth for global capital, the 50 trillion, um, is war spending. So wars, wars meet that goal. They, they, they buy up products, they blow up bombs, they destroy things that have to be rebuilt. Um, it's a massive profit making mechanism. And so we see that. And then also the continued privatization of the commons. So everything that we hold in commons is up for grabs and privatizing. So the world's total wealth is estimated about 250 trillion. So we say, well, 50 trillion is, you know, is the only part of that wealth, but that's true. But this is the free floating money part. This is a concentrated global capital money that can be invested basically anywhere that they can get a good return. And so that is what drives our military. That's what drives our governments. It drives all capital governments and it drives the, and it's the motivating force behind um, <clears throat> the intelligence agencies and what they're doing worldwide. So we have 80% of the people in the world are living on less than $10 a day. The poorest half of the global population lives on less than 250 a day. So the inequality is, is just massive. It's incredible. And there's one, more than 1.3 billion people in the world live on $1.25 a day. So, and then each day, every day, um, 30,000 people die from starvation and mal malnutrition mal internationally. And that's a staggering loss. 10 million fatalities a year just from chronic hunger. And hunger, that we have more than enough food in the world to feed everybody. Hunger is a failure to distribute that food where people can eat it and, and have access to it. But there's, in, in my book, Global Power Elite, I identify 300 people individually with their bios, their, their net worth, where they went to college, how they're interconnected, what policy groups they're on. This is the they, when we say they are doing this to us. 
And I, for years, heard, you know, they did this, they did that, they assassinated Kennedy. This is who benefited, benefits from military empire and global power. And these are the activists within that system, these 300 people. So I think it's really important to know who they are and to be able to act on that in a real open way. It's sort of like pulling the covers off the global elite and saying, this is who they are, and we need to be in their faces about what, what's happening in the world. So the danger is that global power elites will fail to recognize the inevitability and economic uh, disasters. Um, capitalism is, it will collapse again. And next time we may be in for, for global war that goes along with that, massive unrest and starvation. We already know what a pandemic can do to the world. And so that's, these are very important issues that we all face. So without significant corrective adjustments by the global power elite themselves, mass social movements are, and rebellions will occur and they have to occur. They will, they will occur and expand and challenge the global power elite who already many of them are seeing the writing on the wall. That's what the Davos uh, <clears throat> uh, refit is all about. The, you know, we're gonna remake capitalism and, and have the top corporations of the world take care of everybody. Um, that's not gonna solve it. That is not gonna be the end all and, and, and solve that whatever. No, it requires action at all levels, I'm certainly inspired about all the people here today. Uh, we need to be aware of who the elite are and what they're doing. And um, we need to be challenging them very openly, very directly uh, in person whenever possible. And um, that's, and following a, a common code. And I end my book with, the, with reprinting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which I think is one of the best moral instruments out there for us in terms of a guidance for whatever social action uh, we're engaging in. So I'll rest with that. Thank you. And with that, he rests. Thank you. And your testimony will be submitted into the record. Thank you very much.